the necessity of a significant number of college age people to get jobs because they won't need them. If that happens, that actually will raise wages for everybody else because there'll be fewer people looking for jobs. So education has that effect. You guarantee a public education. So let's say you go to Germany and or France, which for the most part, public college is free. You don't see a lot of people in that age group, you know, 16 to 24 working, or at least not as much as here. Because they don't have that necessity to pay for it or various things like that. You just don't see it. They have a greater percentage of people working in the kind of middle 24 to 55 in the U.S., but the U.S. has more people who are older than that and are younger than that working. And education does that. Another thing would be regulation. And the big thing about regulation, antitrust. Break up unions. I'm going to say unions, I'm sorry. Break up monopolies. It's kind of a big difference there. If monopolies are broken up, that will make sure that smaller companies will not only put out better products, have more incentive to uh, innovate because they're in competition, but also companies who compete with each other for workers raises wages. The more companies competing, wages go up. So for 40 years, the United States aggressively went after antitrust violators. Today, not at all. Not at all. So you have fewer companies controlling the marketplace, and what happens is that will push wages down, by definition. Uh, I'm going to get back to a few more, but I'm just going to show you this really quick. You get more, but what this means is you put workers, it creates demand. Demand, now companies, we can sell stuff. So they increase supply, which is production, or more stores, however it might be. But then, once companies start realizing we're making money, we're making money, I should produce more. Employment. And the important thing to understand about the employment here, companies won't start hiring workers unless they think that additional worker will make them money. So it means here, when this happens, right here, this means profit. Companies' profits are going up. They're not going to hire workers if no one's buying their stuff and their profits are going down. Hey, we're selling stuff. We can do this. We're going to make more money if we hire more workers. And that puts money into people's hands. That is the engine of trickle-down economics. That is how it works. Did I say trickle-down again? Yeah. The engine of Keynesian economics. Sorry about that. And it's a totally different attitude. You know, trickle-down economics is very social Darwinistic. We only trust those on top to do the right thing. They're the only ones who know how to work with this money. Here, it's implying that no, Workers are intelligent. They're, of course, they might make mistakes, but they are the ones who can achieve economic growth, can make right decisions, can improve the economy. Leave my process. And I can say the way All right, so with this, there are going to be a few other things I'll get to, but this is the definition of not social Darwinistic. 
There really is idea that we are going to put money and the economic power really does lie in the people. And so the thing is, this is what they would have said back in the 1930s, small d democratic. So I'm not, I don't mean the democratic party. I just mean democracy. The people have power. Where it trickled down, the idea is most people would blow the money. They don't know how to use it. We're going to put money on the very top because they know what to do. And so, a couple more things I had to get to antitrust or regulation. I just wanted to finish it for Anna. Also, bank regulation. I forgot that or I didn't have that one. Another key element of this would be, especially going on after World War II, would be health care. Some kind of health insurance. The U.S. would only do this on a very limited basis. But you see, well, Keynesian economics is going to become the dominant economic philosophy after World War II in the U.S. and Canada, Western Europe and Japan. Basically, uh, the modern industrialized world after World War II outside of the Soviet Union. Yeah. What, what was the bank? Bank. Bank regulation. Just to make sure the banks, remember the Glass-Steagall Act? Yeah. Make sure there's something like that. To make sure there's no bubbles. Oh. Because bubbles, yeah, some people might get super rich in the bubble, but it always pops and leads to an economic downturn, and so they want to avoid those. Uh, that's a union. It's good. All right. Also, monetary policy. Do you remember monetary policy? Do you remember that? Do you remember me saying it? <laughs> yes. I know it's one of those things you got to kind of look back. It's there somewhere in the deep, dark, and frightening recesses of your mind. You wrote some paper. <coughs> oh, wow. oh. Controlling interest. Exactly. Where is it? That, was nice. that was one of, of the causes of the Great Depression. Oh, it's like wait, interest rates. Controlling the money supply. In bad economic times, cut interest rates and get more money out there. And then when you start prices start going up too high, raise interest rates, slow things down. So in bad times, keep interest rates really low, get money into circulation. Yes. So this, is, this is all in your government. Yeah, these are all still government. Yeah, part of Keynesian economics. And I'm forgetting one. Oh, public works. Gosh, big one. Also, public works, especially in bad times. Public works are things at the WPA. There's always going to be roads or bridges or things like that to build. And so what Keynesian economics says, especially in bad times, that is the time to do repairs on infrastructure or build new infrastructure. Because that will fill in the hole in demand because of debt deflation, provide people jobs, but in good times, infrastructure will lead to better economic growth. Think about good roads, you can get your goods to market, get raw materials to production. People can go and buy your stuff. So all these infrastructure things should happen then. In fact, that's a that was the whole idea. Bad times, bill, bill, bill. Good times, it's already built. And so hires workers, gets demand out there. And public work infrastructure, it's going to be, I know this is all for most of this is for workers, but it's also direct aid for business. You know, business can't function without good infrastructure. If they had to pay for it themselves, there would be no business. And so this is a big deal. Think about Amazon. They would never buy anything on Amazon. I remember that was new. They could not function without the government. You know, the government provides them with all the infrastructure they need. If the infrastructure did not exist, there would be no Amazon. Basically, the government, the people of the U.S. is given a lot of money. That and a huge tax break, but that's another story. So, public works, all of these are huge government aid. And the whole idea is pump money in. Oh, also, almost forgot, taxes. Taxes can have a very big effect. In bad times, do cut taxes, but focus those tax cuts for Make sure they help. Boom. Yeah. People on the bottom should know they'll spend it. There could be some tax cuts for those on top of bad times, but they don't necessarily have to spend it for the, for very wealthy because they don't need things right away. That's always kind of the whole trickle map. 
And in good times, that's where you have the progressive tax like the Wealth Tax Act. That's Keynesian. All right, so that is it. That is the engine of Keynesian economics. And until the absolute economic disruptions of the late 1970s, plus years of attacks on it, Keynesian would go away. It's still, I mean, we still have elements of Keynesian it can't get rid of because it's so, well, incredibly prosperous. But to give you an idea where we're at today, all elected Republicans are tripled. Every Republican running for president is tripled. The, the one that is the closest to having a little bit of Keynesian is Trump. Of the people running for president there today. On the Democrats, the Democrats are pretty split. To give you an idea of the presidential nominees, Hillary Clinton is much like Obama. They try to straddle the fence. They try to do both, Keynesian and triple down. For lots of reasons. That's something to do with campaign donations, I, I would guess. Bernie Sanders is with probably a slight majority of the Democratic Party now, which is completely Keynesian. They're completely Keynesian. And that's where we're at now. And if I was a gambling man, this will be in the next presidential election. It really will be a bigger fight whether or not we'll go back to this system or not. But are there problems? Every system's got problems. And you'll notice there's some elements of socialism in this. A lot of this, like Social Security or direct aid or public works, and help for education, socialists. But it's to save capitalism. Where's the problem? Remember, tricking all that problems, oversupply and speculation with the biggies. Here? Well, this one should be pretty big. Debt. Yeah, the debt. Every year the deficit will go up. And if you have bad economic times, tax revenues are going to be down, so the deficit can explode. The debt. Is there another problem? Here. Okay, just imagine if it's really humming along and you have more and more people getting more and more jobs. And by the way, as companies demand more workers, what happens to wages? They're down. If they demand more workers, yeah, because they're now companies are literally competing with each other for workers. And that's when you start seeing wages go up. That has only happened once in your lifetime. <coughs> we have that just rising wages. It's not now. It's happened a few times in my lifetime. I remember. I'm old. I remember the 18, 1898 big wage increase. Remember that? Yeah, my lifetime. But what happens? So wages are going up. People have more money. They want to buy stuff. What happens to prices? Prices go down. Prices go down. Yeah, people, more people trying to buy. Everyone goes in the store. I want to buy, buy, buy. What do the stores do? That's where you get inflation. You get inflation. Not only with wages, wage, wage inflation, price inflation. You get inflation. Price is going to go up. So, two big problems, and they are related. Higher debt can lead to higher inflation. Now, we have virtually no inflation now, but I can remember, well, in the 1960s, Late 60s, we had 4.5%, 5% inflation, which was seen as really hot. And a couple times in the early 70s, or the mid-70s, it got up to as high as 11 or 12%. And then at the end of the decade, going into the 1979 to 1980, it was over 20% inflation. Of course, gas prices went up 400%. That had a lot to do with it. But still, there's a lot of inflation that what does turbinal economics have built into it to help solve these problems? Well, the first one's pretty simple. If more people are employed, you don't need as many of these programs, do you? If more people have jobs, you don't need the direct aid anymore. If more people have jobs, you won't have to have the direct help for people to have their own jobs. When the economy gets good, government spending will drop. That's idealized. Has everyone got that? Times are good, you can start getting rid of these government programs. I'm not saying you get rid of government, but you get rid of the programs. There's also something else. When times are good, that's when you, according to Keynes, raise taxes. 
raise taxes in good times. Not only will that then limit the debt and give you some cushion in case you get another bad economic time, but if you take money out of people's hands, what does that do to demand? You drop demand, inflation will go down. And by the way, playing with taxes and all these programs, that's called fiscal. Fiscal spending, spending programs, taxes. But then, remember, we still have monetary. If prices are going up, what can the Federal Reserve do to interest rates? Prices are going up really fast. What do you do to interest rates to keep people from buying as much? Price is going up. What are you doing interest rates? Exactly. Increase interest rates. It's like literally putting your foot on the brake of the economy. Because it's a little bit harder to buy stuff. Also, demand slows down, inflation drops. Every recession from World War II to through the 80s was caused by the Federal Reserve. Prices were going up so fast that they made a decision that, okay, let's raise interest rates, cause a very short little recession, it leads to some pain, unemployment, but they lowered again, the economy got going again. Yeah. So interest rates lowers inflation? Yeah. You raise interest rates, it lowers inflation. Because people often can't buy as much, demand drops a little bit, prices are dropping. So the idea is with Keynes, you just kind of keep this nice, steady, growing economy. And that's back when we had really quick recessions. Be like six months or nine months of the boom done. I don't know why you're in it, it might seem like a long time. It would just be old. But not like that anymore. So for trickle down and into, it would be a currency. Say it again. So for trickle down and economics and into economics, it essentially for Keynesian, you'd have a much more, Keynesian economics, at least the way it was done, yes. you'd have much more steady growth. So you wouldn't have as big ups or downs, but steady, steady growth. With trickle down, it really, it does encourage bubbles. So you have a lot bigger bubbles. And, yeah, the 70s was just an incredible time. I, I see this and I blame John Travolta. And so, I think you all agree with me, you know, John Travolta is, right? Yeah. All that's evil comes from him. I'll, I'll explain that one later. Why? Disco and country music. Two of the horsemen of the apocalypse. You agree? Hmm? All right, so. That's Keynesian. The U.S. would do this. Now, one of the big problems is too, though, and this is actually something that happens every time. In good times, when you're supposed to raise taxes, no politician wants to raise taxes. And in good times, when they should actually cut spending because you don't need it as much, no, they want to buy more stuff. Because then they can go back to the <laughs> constituents and say, I built you a college. And so there's going to be flaws. You know, People are not rational and they want support, so they're going to be whole, just like in any economic policy. But you combine of the New Deal, especially programs like the Glass Steagall and the SEC, but then the biggies of the second New Deal, like the Wagner Act, Social Security, the WPA, the Wealth Tax Act, and then with the overall concept of Keynesian economics. Something that has never happened before or since. For 40 years, from the end of World War II all the way through the early 1980s, we have something called the Great Compression. And the Great Compression happened in the U.S., U.S. and Canada, Western Europe, North, Western and Northern Europe, Japan, if you see industrialized countries, Australia too, after World War II, the gap between the rich and the poor shrunk. Now, the gap between the rich and the poor really didn't change a lot, but with capitalism, it began to grow dramatically. Capitalism, great economic tool for innovation and creativity and production, but it does focus the money on top because they get the profits. 
you know, or why else take the risk? Well, the gap shrunk. The gap shrunk. And this is a big shift. And so those on top, yes, they got wealthy, but not as fast as, actually not as fast as those on the bottom, which has never happened before. And you will see a real big change in American society from this. An America that everybody today still imagines, especially if they're a little bit older than you, but you've been trained, taught this too, that we have a certain type of country. This great compression gave us this concept of we are a middle class society. In fact, it's so ingrained that you have people that are incredibly wealthy who insist they're in the middle class, and those people don't have much at all want to desperately be in the middle class. What I say is, I remember when Donald Trump said, I'm just a middle class guy. Although he's never been a middle class guy. But the thing about middle class, in reality, it means okay, you gotta work, you gotta work hard, but you can't afford some of the trappings of an upper class lifestyle. And for most Americans, they were just workers. After the New Deal and World War, and when World War II ended, then things could start changing. More people than ever before could afford some of those trappings of a middle class life. And to give you an idea how the stats work, it's actually really remarkable how income changed. Now the graph I show you, I'm gonna show you, has annual income gain, does not count inflation into it, but it's gonna show you how much it grew up to 1979, and then the one I got just because it worked this, it goes up to 2004, but it still shows you what you need to see, Please work. There. Green is from 47 to 79. And look how much income growth. They divided everything into fifths. So the bottom 20% is the lowest fifth, then all the way up to the top fifth, and then they include the top 1%. The bottom fifth, and back in the 50s and 60s, these are people without high school diplomas who are always at the bottom of the economic pyramid. So they still don't have a lot of money, but almost 10% annual income growth. And so the expectation is throughout that time, we're all going to have more money. Life is going to get better, not just for me, but for my children. And if you think tomorrow will be better, what do you do today? Yeah, you, might, you will work harder because I'm going to make something out of myself. I will see some tangible benefit. What would that tangible benefit be? Huh? You buy something with it. Yeah, well, but what you can buy with the money is the big thing. You know, that's just a and all income groups went up dramatically. But those on the bottom actually went up more than the top. And the top went up dramatically. I mean, more than now, it went up during that time. Now, this goes up through 2079, is that when you say the Great Depression began to end into the 1980s, especially that there was a horrible recession, 81, 82. And look at this now. Virtually no gain at all. In fact, if you count towards inflation, almost no gain at all. And this is up to 2004. So that's including the big wage increases in the late 90s. Didn't even come close to the changes here. And yeah, those on top still got a lot. But remember, trick on economics, the goal is to put money into their hands. Now, up to 2004, what is it today? Thank you. No, what's, what would the graph look like today? Negative, negative, negative. Slight increase, slight, uh, decent increase for the top 20, almost all, about 75% of top 1%. Well, that's 5%. So it's all focusing on top. Now that's economic policy, that's what they want. And you make an argument whether that's good policy in the long run or not, but it's a big shift. And it's a big shift. And people had expectations of higher incomes. That does not exist. If you want to know why, there appears to be a lot of discontent in this election year. That's it. That graph shows you exactly why. People grew up believing that if they worked hard, they'll have these kind of income gains, and they just don't exist anymore. And the thing is, well, let me get to this first off. 
what this middle class lifestyle did, it's got more money. This made a dramatic shift on what it meant to be a success in America. More Americans could get this middle class and they began to call it more and more a new, a revised American dream. Now before, yeah, sure, people like to be rich. But back in Jeffersonian America, in fact, for most of the 19th century, it was, you know, you become a farmer. Own your own piece of land. Great Depression in the valley. But the new American dream, more people could afford the trappings of an upper class lifestyle. What are the things, what's something you could buy? Everybody wanted this. <laughs> I heard like five different things. Car, car could be one. Car will be second though. Phone? Radio is But radio, think about consumer electronics. House is the big one. House is number one. And then call. Then call. So house first. Because house became that real sign of wealth. House is something tangible that can go up in value. If you buy a new car, it's gone down in value 20% if then you drive it off the lot. Which is disconcerting. <laughs> why do they want a house? <laughs> huh? Why do they want a house? If you own a house, that means you oh, like own, own a house. Yeah, I oh, own it. Like yeah, I own this house. So no longer do I have to rent. No longer do I need. I, I pretty much have to be reliant on somebody else. I own this. I've made it. I've made myself something. It's no coincidence that. Where did a lot of people who lived in cities would have to rent and be crammed into little tiny apartments? Where'd they move to? Suburbs. Yeah. Suburbs started, now we get to the car. That's a big part of it. But think about all the people who live out here in Helen, right? Which always blows me away since I live in town. I don't drive out there as much. There's so many people that just leave out there. Why? Suburbs. Why Land is cheaper out there. So it's cheaper to build a house. Land is limited in cities, so it's going to be more expensive. That's why people live out there, so they can build a bigger house because land is cheaper. That's the reason why. Now, the I mean, you make your decision. You'd be further away from the city, but then, you, but then again, you get a, a bigger house or you can build your own house. It's a little cheaper. And that fits right in any car, don't you? The car would be the next one. I made it. I own a car. And that's one of the things. Remember the 1920s, that video they talked about, you know, I could have we didn't have much money, but we bought that Model T. You know, it's beginning in the 20s. I made it. I got a car. In fact, I'm sure it's the same way. I mean, I know it is talking to students who have graduated in the past. I want the big thing is, okay, I got a car. Got a car. You know, the first thing they had to buy. In fact, we live in a society kind of need one. At least here. You go to a big city, you don't need one as much. But here, you definitely need one. So a car. And then you mentioned the radio and okay, radio and phone were important. Washer and dryer, especially that dryer by the 1950s, was a big deal. But a lot of it would be personified for years with a TV, a television. Now, because of economies of scale, TVs are cheaper, people can afford more. But still, that represented that kind of extras. TV represented the extras in the 1950s that we now take for granted. So I see a couple phones out. That is an extra. You certainly do not need that. You'd be perfectly fine without it, but now we got out because it's just one of the things we need. I didn't, you know, I didn't grow up with one of those. In fact, what did I have? A rock. That's all I had. I wanted to call someone. I just threw the rock at their head. That's all I had. I lost a lot of friends that way. And then two more things that stem from this, and I have no idea what this squiggly line is going to be. It's going to be like one of these things. And Art. All right. It's not so much having kids. It's the idea that your children, your kids, have an opportunity for a better life. I worked hard in a difficult manual job. I'm just thinking, you know, and then my kid can get something better. We live in a society where there's huge amounts of, in this great compression, there's going to be a lot of social mobility, meaning that you're that the next generation might move up in class or move down. You know, it could happen. There's not near the social mobility today for you as it was when I was your age. 
there were significantly more opportunities for social mobility when I was your age. The society has changed a lot. You, know, you, you have a different set of issues. Probably, I would argue, a lot harder than I have. But then again, like I said, all I knew were rocks. Kids, but that is it. Hey, I work hard, they can do better. Your generation right now looks like be the first generation that's got lower uh, income than your parents since the Great Depression. No, it's not that. Yeah, I'm sure there's lazy people, but you know what? Yeah, this class. This class isn't because there's no one here. You guys are the ones who took it. You weren't one of the 15 that dropped it before they ever saw me. Can you believe that? I told them about that too. You did, you told the truth. He's a bad man. Is that what you said? No, it's not. Trust me. I know you're gonna find this hard to believe. But people my age, they too were this. And some were some were not me, I saw that it's real. But kids. And then lastly, and this is a really big part of this new American dream, to know that when I'm done, I can have a retirement. Which is a really new concept. In fact, the thing was, it literally is, and I'm going to say this, it's going to sound a little bit corny, but it's retire with dignity. The idea is that you can choose when you retire. You're not going to be dependent upon somebody else, not going to be a burden on your kids, and can live a, a, a nice, meaningful life after you're not working anymore, not destitute poverty. That became the American dream. And yeah, a little bit, you know, got to buy stuff. But it's not all bad, and we got to buy stuff for the economy. But I think that's a good thing to have a better life for your kids. And you know what? To when you're done working, to have some kind of enjoyment afterwards, I think it's a bad thing. You'll notice that when your parents, maybe they already have, when they get close to retirement, they retire. And it's it's really important to them. It's really important. I, I just think, oh, my, oh, my dad, when he, he worked for 38 years, and he was done. And when he retired, it really meant a lot that he still maintained a nice lifestyle. My mom, she was like a lot of women her age. She was a, a fantastic student and in college, and they got married and quit college, because that's what women did. Because you were married now. You don't need a college diploma. And so she went back to school when I was in junior high and got even though she was pre-med, she went accounting because she was good in math and got a CPA. So she still works full time because she likes to work. It's not because she has to. <laughs> I think it's because she couldn't before, and by gum, she's going to do it. So my mom's pretty. My mom's pretty amazing. I can say that. But she's significantly older in retirement age. She, she still works not because she has to to survive, but she made that choice. And she still has her own company. And so. That is a big deal. And I would argue part of the reason why you have so much discontent, you have politicians playing on people's discontent, is because this is not quite achievable. At least people didn't make it. And death rates amongst especially white men are going up, partially because of that discontent of people. Actually, really fast. And have you heard about that? No, I guess I didn't tell you about that. It's, it's scary, especially when I look at it. And it's, I could arguably fall in that area, my age. Sometimes I'm in it, sometimes I'm out of it, depending on my mood. But, so let me add two more things in really quick with this. That is a new American dream, and you would see it begin to change. But also, one element, I've got to get to this really quick, was a big part of this was the growth of labor unions. And labor unions would eventually make up almost 36% of all workers. And what labor unions did, even though they grew because of the NRA, it's that Wagner Act. And the Wagner Act, once they made the National Labor Relations Board, and people could have had some place to give their grievances if they weren't allowed to start a union, all of a sudden people were desperate for workers. Workers were desperate for this. They knew unions were a step into this middle class. You're going to have development of new labor unions, especially the CIO. The CIO, it's kind of a weird name, but it's called the Congress of Industrial Organizations. 
I know it doesn't make sense. It was going to be part of, you remember the AFML? It was part of that, but the AFML thought, ah, we don't want you. And the Congress of Industrial Organization would create their own industrial union. And this would become a massive one. It would set the stage for new industrial unions, like the Teamsters and other ones. Its leader was an old miner, John L. Lewis. And John L. Lewis would break away and organize it. And he looked to organize industrial or unskilled laborers. And the two key industries were, one was auto, and in the auto industry, what they did is a new method of striking, which the Wagner Act and Roosevelt being reelected emboldened them to do, it's called a sit-down strike. They did it at GM in Flint, Michigan. GM had a big factory in Flint, Michigan. And what the workers did is they demanded the company recognize their union so they could collectively bargain for better benefits and wages. They went into the factory and they actually brought in a bunch of food and they sat down right there on the assembly line and stopped and said, we're not going to allow you to produce one car here. We're not going to allow you to bring in scabs until you recognize the union. Now, this is the winter of 36, 37. Michigan to be pretty cold. And they surrounded with guards and they shut the heat and electricity off and they stayed there for a month and a half. They snuck food in, various things like that. And after a month and a half, GM had to give in. And it's actually called the United Auto Workers, but it's part of the CIO. They organized collective bargaining. And once that happened, all the auto companies had to fall. Yeah. Flint is the, Flint, Michigan's went back from the other. And Flint's actually become this nice, really prosperous middle class town. Then GM will take a tax break and move their factories to Mexico and they shut the factories down. And you know what's happening in Flint today? It's, a, it's kind of a, it's really poor, they're impoverished, they, they should pull out and left. Now, and that's where they started using the water that had, that had it's hard water that pulled the lead out of the old pipes and now they're poisoning all their kids there. And next. Steel. And in the steel industry, the big area of organization was small steel companies. And a couple of them fought very hard. And one of them in Chicago, to get it, the union recognized, would turn out to be in 1937, it's going to be called the Memorial Day Massacre. In Chicago, 1937 where guards and police fired into a peaceful rally to try to get the company to recognize the unions. It was a place called Republic Steel, a smaller steel company. And they opened fire into the crowd and ended up killing 17 and wounding, wounding 70 people. Almost all of them were shot in the back. Now they try to act like, do you remember the Haymarket Affair? Do you remember those? They said, it was a bunch of anarchists. But the National Labor Relations Board looked at what happened and ruled in favor of the union. That's why things were different now. And what happened? They had to recognize the union. Now, before these things kind of happened, workers would be broken. This time, didn't happen. That's why it's Wagner Act's a big deal. And that's where you're going to get, by the end of World War II, over 35% of all workers with a union job. And that raised wages for everybody else because companies who didn't want the union had to raise the wages for their workers or they'd get a union. Yes, yeah. it's the National Labor Relations Board. National Labor Relations Board. Remember, that was the thing, the National Labor Relations Board, created by the Wagner Act. Mm -hmm. Now, let me give you one more thing really quick. Yeah. What was the percent Union membership by the end of World War II. It went up 35%. It went up to 35% of all workers. Okay. So it actually went up about 350%. Now, one thing real fast, I know the bell's about ready to ring, but let me add this. So the legacy of the New Deal and the Great Depression are all things we talked about in class, but let me just list it really quick. You have that Democratic Roosevelt Coalition, 
for the Democrats. You have the Great Compression. You have other stuff. My mind froze. Uh, new middle class. The growth of labor unions. Hmm? Am I in your way? Sorry. Roosevelt Coalition, Great Compromise, Middle Class, Growth of Labor Unions, also an incredible growth in government. Government got bigger, more powerful, more bureaucracy, and that can certainly lead to problems down the road. Doesn't mean it's good or bad necessarily, but it could be. Also, the financial system became shockingly boring. Financial stability all the way to the beginning to get rid of those regulations. And you're setting up the United States on the cups of unprecedented economic growth. No one is ever gonna see anything like that. Especially after World War II, all the biggest economic competitors of the United States around the world are gonna be devastated for 10 years. The US is really on the verge of becoming a superpower. <coughs> you see the beginnings right here. Not military, but economic. <coughs> Any questions? I just had to get to that last bit. Any questions for the test? Now, three R's. Everybody remember what those are? Uh, reform, recovery. Reform, recovery. Uh, and what? Relief. Relief. I want to say revive. Reading, writing, and arithmetic. Wait, did Mary Bridget tell you that? Huh? And that's all I can think of because she told me that every time you and, three and so I'm not gonna ask what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say something like you know, okay, three hours. Give me an example of a law that did move. Is that be okay? I mean I know laws did more than just one, but that'd be a good way to do it. Don't forget the second new deal, Keynesian, don't forget the causes of the Great Depression. Don't forget oh and then this great compression, labor union, that stuff, no problem. So basically everything else the Great Depression. Yeah. Causes of the Great Depression. We're, we're, we're working it. It's all gonna be short answer questions. See you tomorrow. Yeah. Let me make sure. Because you might have to go run and tell everybody. To be honest with you, I can't remember if I signed up for it. <laughs> so just give me one sec. Oh, we're filming class. Want to watch class? No, no.